Okay, so let me uh, let me give you all one more reminder. We've got our next exam, I believe, is next Friday, a week from Friday. So a couple things. Uh, number one, don't forget to do your assessment if you haven't done it already. There's a few of you that haven't. Uh, do it till then, but the sooner the better. All you got to do is come by office hours, and uh, we'll have a quick meeting, and uh, you'll get your uh, credit for that. Uh, and also, I am willing to bet that you all would like a review session for the next exam. I was thinking, I think it was uh, what we did before, like maybe Wednesday at 6 or something like that. Uh, so see if that messes with your schedule or not. Uh, so let's let's tentatively say we'll, we'll get together next Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Uh, send me an email if that doesn't work for you. And uh, the, the structure of the exam will be the same as last time. Uh, we'll start it at, um, well, I'll look back at the email and see. We'll do it the same way unless there's any protests for that. So, okay, any questions before we get started? All righty. With this, I'm alone. Okay, so the last thing we did last time was this theorem here. Uh, and I remember I said it's probably pretty important for us to learn why the product of two negatives is positive. I'm going to go over the proof of this uh, very quickly, not the entire thing, because I think once I give you the idea about the way that some works, you can kind of uh, get the idea for the rest of it. So let's take a look at this. Uh, the first thing, uh, the first thing in this theorem is when you multiply anything uh, by zero, you get zero. That seems like an important thing to be true. So let's see. Uh, let's let's go through this. Uh, if you look at uh, zero times a minus zero times a, this must be zero. Right, because whatever this turns out to be, this is bread minus bread, so that that should be the additive identity of the group, right? And we'll use the distributive property, right? This is zero minus zero times a is zero, but then this is zero, so zero times a is zero. That proves this part. Whoops, that proves zero times a is zero. Uh, actually, yes, it does zero times a. I bet you can use this to figure out how to prove a times zero, just turn this both around. Um, uh, stop me if there's any questions along the way. Okay, so uh, if you look at, for number two, if you look at minus a times b plus ab, What is this? Well, one of the things I can do is I can pull this B out of the distributive property. And this is minus A plus A times B. Okay. And how does that help? Well, this is a big fat zero. And we've proved that, that is zero. So what have we got? We've got this animal equals zero. So take this over to the side, and that means that minus a times b equals minus a b. Which does this part of inequality? The other one is, again, very simple. OK, so let's look at uh, 3. And actually, I'm going to use number 2 on number 3. Uh, so for number three, uh, minus a times minus b. We'll see what, what did number two uh, show us that minus a times b. Uh, well, right. Uh, 
let me write down the step here and I'll, I'll talk this through it, is equal to A times the minus the minus B. Right, because number two says that I can kind of move the sign anywhere I want. Agree? And minus minus B is B. Because that's the inverse of the inverse of B, the additive inverse. And so this is the famous, um, this is the famous um, uh, thing that the product of two negatives is in fact positive. Uh, number four, uh, one thing that I didn't write down on the board that I did write down the last time that we were together, um, if R has one, then negative A is minus one times A. Uh, also, I wrote down that R uh, is unique. So what, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to prove that if R has an identity, a multiplicative identity, then it's unique. So let's suppose I and J are multiplicative identities. That is, when you multiply either I or J by anything in the ring on either side, it leaves a lot. I times R equals R times I. Uh, I equals R. Well, what does this mean? If you look at I, this is I J. Why? Because J is an identity. But I is an identity too. So this is J. So I and J are the same. I feel a little dirty after doing that. That's kind of icky. Uh, notice it's actually important here because notice to make the step, I use the fact here that J is a right identity and that I is a left identity. Uh, that comes up actually in your homework calculator. So so I want to now call I. One. I'm going to call it one because there's there's only one of these we proved, and I'm, I'm just going to call it one from now on. Um, notice that uh, notice that a plus uh, minus a. If you look at A plus this, this is one times A plus minus one times A. Because A is the same thing as one times A. And this is pulling the A out, one minus one times A. And this again is zero, which is zero. Therefore, A plus minus one times A, zero. And taking this over the other side, I get minus one times A is negative A. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave number five as kind of Fun inductive exercise. I do most of it actually in notes. I'll let you kind of work through that. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay, so I want to do a lot of kind of examples and, and, and terminology. Uh, I'm going I'm to give you all some terminology that, that's going to be important for rings, uh, certain types of elements and rings and so forth. And I'm going to start off with something called zero divisors, which you're not really used to uh, so much. You may have seen this, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this in linear algebra, although it probably wasn't termed this way. Uh, you probably heard the, the, the guys of um, a singular matrix. Um, definition. Here we'll say R is a ring and A is an R. And 
so that A is the R. Number one, uh, we say that A is a left and zero divisor. Left, zero divisor. Or something like zero divisor. Uh, if there exists a B non zero, such that A, B, and zero. Uh, and we say that it's a right zero divisor. Say A is right zero divisor. If there exists a non zero B in R such that the A equals zero. A zero divisor. Uh, a is a zero divisor if it is both a left and a right zero. A is a zero divisor. If it is both a right and left. Okay. Um, I want to finish this definition by giving a couple of examples too. Uh, we say A is no potent if A and zero sum in the natural numbers. Uh, what it means to be no potent is some power of A is zero. Uh, three, um, actually, I need a caveat here. For three, I'm, I'm going to assume that R has an identity. We say, U and R is a unit if there exists V and R such that U V V V. And this is why you need the identity because this definition doesn't make sense unless there's a one in the ring. Uh, and U R is the set of units of R. So if I ever write U of R, what I mean by that is the units of R. Let me point out that if R has an identity, at least one will be in there because one times one is one. Dr. Coy, can you Yes. Um, if an element is nil potent, does that mean that every power greater than N is also zero? That is correct. Uh, his, his observation is correct because Let's suppose that it's no potent and it takes 10 powers to get zero. Well, then every power after that will continue to be zero. Everybody okay for that? Thank you. Okay, so let's look at some examples here. Uh, and let me let me uh, uh, let me point out that. Okay, these are two by two matrices with real cool fishes. This is a zero divisor. Right? Do you might think it's something that you can multiply by to get zero? Let's try this. I 
actually, right this way. Yes. Yeah. 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 This is uh, isn't it just anything with zeros in the bottom too? Right. Um, so this is is left zero divisor, right zero divisor. Zero divisor and nil potent. Because notice they use the same thing, right? But you're right. If, if I could have zeros on the top and uh, one zero on the bottom, then that would work as well. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, let me point out that you may not be able, so let me ask you this. So if you look at this matrix here, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0, 2, what do you get? Well, this makes this, this is a left zero divisor, and this is a right zero divisor because neither one of these are zero. Notice what happens when you multiply them in the other order. Notice you get zero, one, zero, zero. So the reason I do this example is this way. So A is left zero divisor means there exists a non-zero B such that um, A, B equals zero. A is right zero divisor. If there exists a non zero C such that CK equals zero. Now, let me point out, as in this example here, just because AB is zero does not mean that BA has to be zero. Because here, AB is zero, but when you do it the other order, you get something that's not zero. Right? Uh, so when I say it's zero divisor, that means that there's a B that I can multiply it on the left and get zero, and a C that I can multiply it on the right and get zero, and it doesn't have to be the same. Right? It's important here that um, it's important here that B is non-zero, right? Somebody give me an example. If you have a ring that has more than just zero, let me point out that the element zero by itself is a ring. Right, always because it's closed under multiplication, stringent property, it's a group under addition, blah, blah, blah. If you have a ring that has more than just the zero element, there is always a zero divisor. Can anybody tell me what it is? What happens when you multiply zero times anything? What do you get? Zero. You get zero. So if you have anything that's not zero and you multiply zero by it on either side, you get zero. So zero is always a zero divisor. There are some textbooks that say a zero divisor is a non zero element, and we call those textbooks wrong. Zero is a zero divisor in any ring that contains uh, something that's other than zero, and there's important reasons for this. This example right here, this is a nil potent element. Right? There's a power of it that is uh, zero. It turns out that any nil potent element is a zero divisor, but not all zero divisors are nil potent elements. Um, let me give you another uh, concrete example here. Let's look at uh, let's look at an old friend.
Uh, what's this? It's about the easiest to say. Zero more. Uh, forgive me for doing this, but I am going to write everything down so it can classify. Z18, zero bar, one bar, two bar, three bar, four bar, five bar. So what I want to do here is I want to find all the magic thingies that I was talking about before. I want to find nil potents if they exist, zero divisors if they exist, and units if they exist. Okay. Here is Z18. And notice 18 is zero. We know how to add and multiply here. Uh, can anybody find any zero divisor at all? Zero. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. Good start. Yes, yeah, zero is always zero divisor. Can anybody find something that's not zero that's a zero divisor? Two is anybody see what you multiply two by? Get zero by? Nine. Nine work. I'm going to kind of pair these off. Zero, two, nine, or zero divisors. Right? So three and six. Okay. All right. All right. Three, six. Those pair off. What else we got? Well, two times nine is 18. Four times nine is 36, which is a multiple of 18. So four is as well. My goodness, they should work for eight as well, shouldn't it? Eight times nine is 72. That's a multiple of 18. Shouldn't 12 and 15 work by that same token? That's right. And notice, I'm starting to see a pattern here because what has to happen? For me to multiply something to get zero, to multiply something to get zero, I have to have a factor of 18 in it, right? So I've got to have two threes and nine. Everybody agree with that? 12 has actually got a three and a two, so I can actually multiply that just by three and get zero. Uh, and uh, what, what else do you say 15? That should work because 15 times, uh, let's see, what have I got? Three, I need another three and a two, I need a six. 15 times uh, six is 90, that should work. Right. Anything else? Ooh, 16, it may work, 16 should work. 10 words. Okay, 10's got a two, so all needs a multiple of nine. 10 times nine, 90, that works. What else? Anything else? All right. 14. 14. These are all the zero divisors. Does anybody see what they what these numbers have in common? What, what, what just the composites that don't, I mean, it's just the composites. Yeah. And the primes that make up 18. Ah, uh, that's right. What these what these numbers have in common is they all have a, a factor, a non-trivial factor in common with 18. All of these are divisible by either two or three. Have I agreed with that? What's left over, what are, what's left over, what do they all have in common? They're all prime numbers. Oh, prime numbers without factors of 18? Or I it makes sense. This is an unfortunate example, and you were correct uh, that they're, they're, they're all prime numbers, but they don't have to be. The important thing about it is that they have no factor in common with, uh, with 18. 
right there. So, so the greatest common divisor of whatever's left over with 18 is one. Everybody okay? Every nilpotent is a zero divisor. So the nilpotents should be a subset of this. Which of these, if any, sometimes you don't have no points, but here you do. Can anybody tell me which ones of these are your no points? There's three of them. Well, let's say six. Okay. Zero is one, six is one. What else? Okay. Well, that is cool. To be a nil potent, what has to happen when I take a big enough power of that number, it has to be divisible by 18. Agreed? How many different primes does 18 have to divide? Two? And three. So anything that's no potent has to have a two and a three, right? And then if you take a big enough power, it will eventually be divisible by 18, right? Which numbers have factors of both two and three? Factors of six. These are the nil potents. None of the other ones are nil potent, right? What happens if you take powers of three? You get three, nine, 27 is nine. Uh, so the powers of the three, nine, 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 like that. What happens to the powers of two? Two, four, eight, 16, 32, uh, and 32 minus 18 is 14, and then 28, which is 10, and then 20, which is two, and it cycles back to two, and then it starts over again. Three is kind of weird because it just uh, it, it fixates on one power, but two two runs through two four six eight uh, two four six eight sixteen uh, fourteen uh, ten and like two. Okay, any questions? The units. Or what's left over? One, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, seven. By the way, can anybody tell me why any of these is a unit? I'll do a proof for one. Uh, clearly, one's a unit because one times one is one. But all of the rest of these should have inverses. How do I know that they've got inverses? Well, what do these things have in common with 18? They're relatively prime to 18. So GCD, uh, for example, 11 and 18 is equal to 1. Anybody remember what is important about that from the first homework? What is true when the greatest common divisor of two integers is equal to one? Anybody remember that? Is it that you can write them as a linear combination that equals one? That is correct. So there exists A, B, and the integers such that 11A plus 18B is equal to one. Right. Now reduce this mod 18. And this thing right here is a big fat zero. So I get 11 bar times a bar is equal to one bar. So whatever this a turned out to be, reduce it mod 18, and that'll be the inverse of 11. And uh, in fact, I, I challenge you to sort of find the inverse. 17 should be its own inverse because 17 is the same thing as uh, minus one. And in fact, notice these are all in minuses. So you should be able to 
use that. Uh, let's see. Uh, what's the inverse of five, for example? Let's see, 1937. That should be 11. 55, 54. Yeah. These two are inverses of each other. And I bet seven and 13 are inverses of each other. And you should put together. Okay, any questions? So that, you might play around with some other examples. You will find if you change 18 to any n, um, you know, any n two or greater, then what will happen is every element of Z mod n will be either a unit or a zero device, right? And some of them will have nil potents other than zero and some will not. It depends on whether it's divisible by a square or not. Do not let this deceive you. Uh, let me give you a quick example here. In the ordinary image of Z, uh, What are the zero divisors in Z? What integer can you multiply a non zero integer and get zero? There's only one. That's it, right? Because if you multiply two non zero integers, you get a non zero integer, right? That's an old familiar friend. You multiply two non zero integers, you get non zero n. So, the only way to multiply an integer by something uh, that's not zero and get zero is if your integer is zero and vertices, right? The only zero divisor in the integers is zero. Zero is always no power, it's any power of it, it's zero. What are the units? Which integers have inverses that are still integers? Well, which integers is the reciprocal of that integer still an integer? Well, I guess two doesn't work. This will take a while. Two is three. Notice everything is bigger than two or equal to two. Its reciprocal is less than one and greater than zero. So therefore not integer. So it can't be anything two or bigger. By the same token, it can't be anything negative two or smaller. So the only possible units are zero, and that's impossible because the reciprocal of zero doesn't exist, plus or minus one. So the integers had one zero divided, which is zero, two units, which is plus or minus uh, one, integers are none of these. And these are often called regular elements. That is, elements that are neither zero divided nor Okay, any questions? Questions? Okay. Let me give you a couple of quick results here. One of them I'll sketch the proof. The other one uh, is a homework exercise. Um, proposition. One. Then the units of R, this is the U and R, such that U is a unit, is a group under multiplication. Um, Let me get a quick proof here. 
uh, no that if you and Z or in you are, then U V times V inverse U inverse equals V inverse U inverse U V equals one. So close. Uh, we have associativity because in a ring, multiplication is associative, so we've got that. Identity, there's the identity, it's the um, identity of R because we did say that um, that's a commuter here. Uh, actually, Scratch that word. Um, all you need is, is one. Um, we have associativity, we have the identity, and by definition, for all you and you are, you inverse. And there you go. So it's a group under multiplication. Um, Okay, uh, I'm going to upgrade my wording on this next one here. Next proposition, uh, 918. What? Or be commuted and X, Y, and R local then uh, X plus Y is no. Uh, additionally, if R has an identity, as identity, and U is a unit of R, then U plus X is a unit. Okay, so the content of this theorem is this. Uh, if you take two nil potents and add them up, you will get a nil potent. Uh, this is not true for zero positives. You need the stronger condition of nil potent. In fact, it is possible to add up two zero positives and get a unit, right? But if you add two nil potents, it's nil potent. The assumption. Commutative is extremely important here. If you remove this assumption, this is no longer true. It's possible to add, in fact, if you have a ring that's that's not commutative, it's it's possible to add nil potent to the unit, but not the commutative case. The second statement is if again x is a nil potent and u is a unit, then when you add a unit and a nil potent, you get a unit, which is kind of cool. Um, Again, you need commutativity of the ring for this to uh, hold true. Okay, so you, you probably kind of uh, looked about that or thought that because this is a, a homework exercise. But any questions? Okay, um, there's a special kind of ring to follow the definition. Let's let uh wait this one here now. What are the, the ring such that R minus zero? 
Uh, what I mean by that, this is set minus. So this is all non-zero elements bar uh, form a group under multiplication. Okay, uh, before I finish the definition, let's think about what this means. What you have is you have a ring. Uh, the ring itself is a group under addition. Now you take zero and jerk it out because zero has no chance of having a reciprocal. You jerk out zero and you got everything left. What if this forms a group under multiplication? Well, let me tell you what we already know. We already know that when you multiply two elements, uh, of this uh, non-zero elements, then what you get is an element in the ring. It might actually be zero because we've seen examples where you multiply two non-zero things to zero. But when you say it's a group under multiplication, you're saying a couple of things. Number one, you're saying that when you multiply two non-zero elements, you get a non-zero element, right? So it's impossible under our assumption here to multiply two non-zero elements to get zero because this set R minus zero must be closed under multiplication. And you can go a step further. Not only is it true that when you multiply two non-zero elements, you get a uh, non-zero element, but every non-zero element actually has its reciprocal still on the ring. Uh, That is, every non zero element of R is a unit. Uh, then we call this a division. We say R is a division. That is, every non zero element of each of A commutative division ring is called a unit. Uh, let's see. How about a show of hands from you guys out there? Because I'm looking at your uh, rather hard to make out faces. And somebody's got your camera on. Uh, you guys can do that. I mean, I, I get it if you want to show up in your pajamas. I, you don't have to turn on your camera. But if you can, it's easier to make. But anyway, uh, let's have a show of hands. How many of you have heard the terminology field before? Did you hear this in maybe um, linear algebra? Okay, right. So I see that there's a, yeah, there's a couple of you. Yeah, you saw this in linear algebra. So you talked about vector spaces over a field and your scalars came from a field. And probably when you were in linear algebra, your field was usually the real numbers. So, so for some examples of fields, I'll give you a number of examples of fields. Uh, actually, let's start here. Let's start here. The rationals. If you if you jerk out zero, non-zero rational numbers are the form of a over b, where neither a nor b is zero. So if reciprocal b over a is still a non-zero rational number. Um, the reals. Complex numbers. These are all fields that you've probably encountered at some point or another. Uh, how about Z2? Right? Well, this one's easy to kind of wrap your head around because look at Z2. What happens if you jerk out zero bar? All you've got is one bar. That's a group under multiplication. This is a field. Every non zero element is inverted. But so is Z3. You can check that. Z5. 
And in fact, ZP for any prime. These are all two ways as well. Um, there are others. Notice all my all, all the examples that I've given you so far are commutative, right? These are all division rings that are commutative. These are all fields. Uh, what about other examples of division rings? Well, if if any of you have ever heard of quaternions, uh, if you're a physics junkie, you may have run across that at some point. This is an example of a division ring that's not a field. Uh, you can take a field and adjoin multiple polynomial variables that don't commute and look at its quotient field. We'll talk about that later. That's an example of a division ring. Um, right, and they, these are all examples of uh, fields and division rings. Um, definition. Um, one, two, 11. Definition. This is a very important type of ring. Uh, of course, fields are very important. I mean, you do linear algebra over in fields, and they're, they're kind of nice because uh, all their non zero elements are invertible. But there are important rings where you can't always invert everything. Uh, for example, matrix rings where you can't invert everything necessarily. Um, the integers, you can't invert everything. Uh, but here's sort of the next best thing to being a field from that perspective. Uh, a commutative ring with one, this is important. Uh, in this definition, I would always demand my ring commutative by identity is an integral domain. The correct terminology for this is what we're calling an integral domain. Uh, sometimes I will leave the word integral out. So if I ever if I ever say let R be a domain, I mean an integral domain. Uh, it's a community brain identity uh, if uh, zero is the only zero divisor. That is to say, there exists no non-zero zero divisors. Now, what is cool about, so let me make this remark. Why do I care about these rings? Why, uh, uh, you know, of course, zero divisors seem a little weird when you can take uh, something that's not zero and multiply by something else that's not zero and get zero. We've seen that happen when you multiply matrices and linear algebra. But what's the important thing about the integral domains? Um, what's important? Well, commutative with one, so it's easy to get computations with. Uh, when zero is about only non zero zero divisor, an integral domain. The equation a b equals zero implies a equals zero or b equals zero. This is the important thing about integral domains. And whether you know it or not, back probably since you were in high school, you have been using this because when you did stuff in algebra two, or when you start solving polynomials and stuff, uh, trying to find roots of it. Over and over again, you made this assumption. The product of two things being zero means one of the two things had to be zero. Integral domains are precisely the rings, the places where you got to multiply, and you can make this assumption. When I see two things multiplying together to get zero, I know that one of them has to be zero. Um, let me give you this last uh, zero here. Theorem. 
Zero and suppose A is not a zero. Since uh, this is a field, A inverse is in this color F. Therefore, A inverse AB equals A inverse zero. Uh, so one times B equals zero, so B equals zero, and there you have it. We're going to subtract AB zero. If A is not zero, then B is zero. So any integral, any field is an integral domain. The converse of the statement is not true. For example, the integers is an integral domain. It's certainly not a field because, um, for example, uh, two is, is not an integral. Okay, uh, that's good for today. Any any questions before we uh, roll out of here? Anybody got any last minute questions to sort through? Okay, we'll shoot for next Wednesday. Uh, not this Wednesday, the next Wednesday for the review session at, at six o'clock. Let me know if there's any kind of hangups on that. Other than that, I will see you all by Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you.